Okay, once more, uh, good afternoon, and uh, please open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. <clears throat> this is our third and final meditation on the word Emmanuel. <clears throat> what does it mean? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's wrong with my voice. I think I just outsang myself. I love singing so much. And, uh, yeah, it's great. So we'll see what we have left in the tank. But uh, let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25 together. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with a child through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. And the great words of God. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Emmanuel uh, is the word which means God with us. <clears throat> and we saw uh, two weeks ago, that means that Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, it means that our life should not be the same if we have a true encounter with Him. We encounter Him uh, through this church. We encounter Him, encounter him uh, not only through the, the preaching of the message, but also we encounter him through the worship time, the singing, we encounter him in the prayer time, in the testimony, we encounter him especially in the fellowship time as we gather together in his name, and we encounter him as we meet with each other throughout the week in prayer and in Bible study. Uh, and in all of these encounters with Jesus, whether at church, at home, in, in song, or through meditation in the word, all these encounters should revolutionize our life because Jesus is God, Emmanuel. <laughs> also, uh, it means uh, Jesus is God, but Jesus is us. That was our message last week. Uh, Jesus is fully God and also fully human. This is what the Bible teaches, but at the same time, this is a mystery. This is what the church has considered all through history as an amazing mystery. Now, I know we live in the 21st century. Uh, it is a very scientistic uh, a time to live in. And everything is so literal and so uh, uh, wanting to be proven in a literal way. I know that when I read the Bible for the first time when I was 12 and 13, my, my, my Lola, my grandmother, gave me a Bible after I was baptized. And I started reading the book of Mark. I said, I'm going to read the book of Mark. And there are so many parts that I read, and I just thought, how is this possible? Is it literally this? Is this actually what happened? And, and there are so many things that are symbolic, and metaphorical, and poetic in the Bible. Uh, but I, it just went over my head. I didn't know how to read this thing because uh, I was just a child. I, I thought things should, it's just like history or a textbook. Um, 
And so the mystery of what's called the hypostatic union. Jesus is 100% God, 100% human. That's a mystery. Now, that does not mean we just go, oh well, I can't get it, whatever. No, no, no. We use our reason. The reasoning and logical faculties God has given us is a gift. And we use it, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's a mystery that although we cannot comprehend, we are called to apprehend. We hold on to what we can't understand. And to that which we cannot fully wrap our arms around, we trust that He is holding us. And that is the highest So, that, that the fact that Jesus is fully human means, oh, it's so good, we have infinite comfort. Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. He has gone through every struggle, every temptation, everything that we could possibly, oh, well, does that mean Jesus knows what it feels like to have cancer? and to be dying from that? Yeah. Jesus physically suffered. He was tormented physically. He was beaten. He was pierced. He was stabbed. He was nailed. That's physical discomfort. Ah, oh, does it, Jesus know what it feels like to go through depression and be clinically depressed and to be uh, dependent on meds because you're so chemically imbalanced? I would say yes. Jesus knows that. Uh, he knows what it means uh, to, be, to be utterly psychologically and emotionally down in the valley of the shadow of death. He knows that. Does, it, does Jesus know what it means to be betrayed and to be laughed at and to be ridiculed and rejected? Does Jesus know what it means to be, be utterly publicly humiliated for no good reason? Yeah, he does. Because he was human. He suffered, was tempted in every single way that we are. And he, therefore, he identifies with us. That's the infinite comfort, but also, also, uh, that is hu uh, humble joy. What do I mean? Uh, when Jesus became human, it doesn't mean that he gave up his divinity. It doesn't mean he gave up his omniscience or his um, omnipotence, his power. He gave up his omnipresence. He couldn't be everywhere all the time. But the main meaning is what we find in Philippians chapter 2. It says he gave up his glory. It means this. He gave up his glamour. He wasn't out there to get his name out there, to become as famous or as, as, as well loved and liked uh, for that, just, just to be famous. Uh, he went to the people who, who couldn't give back to him. He served and he gave to the people who were never going to be famous. He, he arrived in Jerusalem in the first century. <laughs> it's like, not even Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. Uh, what does that mean? Well, if we encounter Jesus and we meditate on his humanity, it means we'll have nothing to do with fame or uh, popularity for the sake of fame and popularity. We are not going to help the people who can help <coughs> us back. Christians are to be giving to those who cannot give back. It's, it's almost a one-way give, and we'll, we'll, we'll die for those uh, who cannot give anything back to us. Because Jesus was 100% human. Now, Jesus is God, Jesus is us, and today we're going to meditate on uh, uh, Jesus uh, with us. Jesus with us. So, uh, we begin with... The word Emmanuel means God with us. With is the word for relationship. Relationship. So, uh, uh, there's a, 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 a part in, in Mark, in chapter uh, 3, where Jesus calls his disciples, his 12 apostles, and it says this, all it says is this, he called his apostles so that they could be with him. And that's it. So that they can be with him. What does it mean to be with? It's simply this. It's to do life together. To be together. To eat together. To walk together. To wash clothes together. To, to laugh together. It's to have an intimate and personal 
relationship. That's what it means to be with Jesus. And that's what it means for Jesus to be with us. There are, uh, there's a danger in our church uh, that, that sometimes we'll come, we'll come to church, and for, and for those who come for a, a short time, maybe a short contract, one or two years, and they know uh, they're going to be leaving. And we know they're going to be leaving. And so there's a danger to say, well, I know you're going to be leaving, you know you're going to be leaving, so it'll, it'll be nice to see you at church, and we'll smile and shake hands, and we'll do some small talk, but we won't be with each other. We're not going to do life. We're not going to share our heart to heart. And I know there's, there's boundaries, and there's also, you know, you have to keep a certain distance. This one comedian said it recently. He said, life is hard. Oh, oh hello. Uh, but we're going to get through it together. And that means when we're coming to church and we're with people we don't see on a daily basis, and even though we know they're going to be gone in a couple of years, <clears throat> if Jesus came to be with us so that we can be with each other, there's a boundary that we can cross. There's a door to be opened so that we can live life together. And uh, there's a vulnerability that comes along with the word with. Okay, but it goes even further than that. Uh, it's more than just believing in Jesus. There's intimacy, there's life. Uh, I want you to think about your Bible. Think to the first book, and even the first two chapters. God makes our first parents, Adam and Eve, and God was with them. It says that He was re regularly walking together with them. Adam and Eve, they rebel against God, they disobey His command, and now they are pushed out of the garden. They are exiled from the presence of God. They cannot be with God's full presence. You with me? Thousands of years later, generations later, finally God solves the problem. And that is Jesus, Emmanuel. Now, He's about to open the garden again. He said, I'm going to bring the garden to you. And that's the meaning of God with us. Are you following that? That's Emmanuel. Now, here's the problem. There's one word I want us to focus on today. What does it take for us to be with Jesus, to have an intimate, personal relationship? What does it take? The word is courage. You can be that. This is the, the first of two enunciation passages in the Bible. Enunciation means the angel comes to Mary, the angel comes to Joseph and annunciates the name Jesus, Emmanuel. The first passage is here, Matthew. The second one is in Luke. Now, Luke and Matthew. Two Christmas stories, completely different outcomes. In the Luke story, the end is awesome. The sky lights up. There's angels, and they're singing, glory to God in the highest. It's joy, right? That's Luke. It's this wonderful singing and beautiful, you know, it's just, it's amazing. Matthew? First is shame. Next is uh, uh, rejection. And it ends in bloodshed. Okay? We're going to look at shame and rejection today. Well, just so you know, uh, this is Matthew 1, but in Matthew chapter 2, what happens is, there's the king Herod. He hears that there's a new king who's born. So to make sure that that, that, that king doesn't come to take his place, he finds out that the baby is born in Bethlehem. So he sends his officers and kills all the children 
two years and younger. I have twins who are about to turn two and younger. It's called the slaughter of the innocents. It ends in bloodshed. That's the Christmas story of Matthew. And that shows us that this world, in some ways, is actually hostile to the message of the gospel. Okay? It will respond not only negatively, but violently to the gospel. That's what Matthew is trying to say. So what does it take to follow Jesus? To be with Jesus, to have a relationship so intimate and so powerful, it transforms us. It takes courage in the face of violence, rejection, and shame. Three things on courage today. Number one, courage to face the shame. Two, courage. To, 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 to lose control. And three, courage to admit your fault, your sin. So it's three things. If you didn't catch it, it's okay. So, the first thing. Courage to face the shame and disdain. The courage to, uh, to face the loss of re reputation. So, uh, yeah, it, I didn't do much exposition last week, so you're going to get plenty of it today. Okay, so here we are. Uh, Joseph is what's. It says that Joseph was a righteous man. Uh, here, uh, in verse 19, he's a good guy. Okay, so he hears about. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe he talks to Mary. He's Mary, his fiance, she says, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Joseph knows it's not by him. That can only mean one thing. She's been sleeping around, unfaithful to him. She cheated on him. But instead of making it public and you, terrible woman, I'm going to divorce you, and everybody's going to look at you with it. He says, I'm going to divorce her quietly. He is a good guy. He's probably known in that small town, that carpenter. He's the town carpenter. He's got a reputation. He's a good guy. So I'm going to just, okay, we were, we were engaged, we're done. Just going to put her away, move on with our life, live quietly. The angel says, no. Go ahead and marry her. Go ahead and take her as your wife. And not only that, adopt this boy that's going to be born. Do you know what that means? Could you imagine Joseph speaking with his friends? Guys, guys, listen. I, I know... It looks bad, but here's here's what happened. Okay, the Holy Spirit, you know, God came over her, and now she. What is his friends gonna say? Really, Joseph? You, you had a dream, and some angel told. Yeah, but he has to understand. There are some people who cannot understand the truth. The truth. And from this point on, if he goes with what the angel tells him to do, he has to kiss his reputation goodbye. Okay? He has to take this woman, the whole town is going to know, this is a shame, honor society, very small city, everybody knows each other, they probably watched Joseph grow up, they are watching Mary grow up, they know this couple, and they know that if they get married, the baby's born. Wait, it, it hasn't been ten months. It hasn't been nine months. What's going on here? What? You mean, you got married to a pregnant woman? They're going to be treated as second-class citizens their whole life from now on. Rejection. Shame. Now, you know, the thing is... If you're a Christian, you have to understand 
not everybody's going to be, oh, well, congratulations, you got baptized. Oh, that's nice for you. No. And not only that, if you're a Christian and you're going to make some decisions in your life, your friends are not going to understand. Even your family. Amen if you know that's true. Even some members of your family, particularly those of us who are Japanese here, who tell their parents, I've become a Christian, I've joined a church, I'm going to get baptized. And then the mom and dad are like, no. And they face that. That's reality. Because some people cannot understand the truth. But this, I just want to say, you know, Jesus... He didn't have to do it this way. He, he didn't have to come through a pregnant, teenage, unwed woman in a patriarchal shame honor. He didn't have to do it that way. Why did he do that? Why? To tell us this. If you want a relationship with, with me, if you want intimacy, Relationship, power, if you want me, you will have no honor except me. I am your honor. I will be your reputation. You have to lean into the shame. You have to embrace the scandal. And you have to just let go because I let go. Take off the glory, take off the glamour, take off the kiss it goodbye. There's going to be some people I'm going to ask you to talk to. It means you're not going to have friends anymore with some people. There's going to be some places I'm going to ask you to go. Others are not going to be with that. Lean into it. Joseph needed courage. Emmanuel, God with us, means we need courage to face the loss of our reputation. That's the first one. The second one is this. Lose, losing our reputation, but also uh, losing our control. Now, uh, this is amazing. The last part we read. Thank <clears throat> okay. God. She gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Did he give him the name Jesus? No. No. God, it says here, Joseph said, don't be afraid. She will give birth to son. You are to give him the name Jesus. Now, what does that say? Joseph, you're going to give him the name, but you didn't decide the name. Two things happen. One is Joseph is legally adopting Jesus as his son. So now Jesus is not David's son by blood line. Jesus is David's son through adoption. Yeah. Ah, oh, I could go on about adoption. I could preach and preach about adoption. Oh. But we'll just leave it right there. You don't need any more kids. <laughs> well, who knows? We'll leave that to Jesus. But the second thing here is happening is, look, in a patriarchal society, the Father has the absolute right to give his child the name. Right? That's his right. Uh, I don't know if you notice, all my sons, they all line up. Kyohei, Kenzo, Kazumasa, Kosuke. Why? They all start with K. Because the reason why I didn't give him Bible names, I didn't name him David or John or Paul. I didn't name him Sam. I wanted I want people to know they're my sons. So they have my initials. K Right? My name starts with a K. Christian. So all of them will have K H A. And all that's just Kaki Ku K Ko. Right? That's why. And then there's my last son, Nike. He's special. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I wanted them to reflect me, and I, and, and I had that right. It was me. I, as a father, had that right to do that. Okay? So here's Joseph. He has the absolute right, and even in even more patriarchal society. And he gave up. He gave that up. Um, <clears throat> 
what's, what, what, what's, what's, what, what's going on here? So, uh, I don't know, we, we, we just had the, uh, the, world, the Rugby World Cup in Japan, just this last uh, few weeks. <clears throat> so, uh, South Africa won, and uh, there's um, a movie about Nelson Mandela, the, the former president of South Africa. It's his life story. It's called Invictus. And the opening, I don't know if you've seen the movie, Invictus? No? Okay, let me spoil it for you. Uh, the very first scene, the screen is black, and you hear Nelson Mandela's uh, voice. He's reading his life uh, kind of philosophy, his theme. His, it's what gave him the strength to, to go through uh, prison and the suffering and the torture and then to get out. So this is what his philosophy was. And here's what he says. Uh, just imagine um, the voice of, of oh, Nelson. Boy, oh. I, thank God, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That's Nelson Mandela's life motto. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. What's Emmanuel's answer to that? Not with me. Not with me. Emmanuel says, I'm the captain now. If you're going to be with me. Listen, if Jesus is in your life, even if Jesus is an infant, you are not his manager. But this child who is about to be born is the manager. Uh, there's the PBC. You know the PBC? The PBC are the people before Christ. People who don't know Jesus. Okay. All right. Here's what here's what they'll say. This so, um, I I I I'll I'll think about being a Christian. I'll, I'll consider being a Christian as long as um, I don't have to do this. I'll, I'll I'll come to church and I'll read the Bible. I I might become a Christian. I'll believe in Jesus as long as I don't have to stop doing this. There's some things in the Bible, I understand what they're saying, I disagree with it, so I'll just take the parts that I like, and I'll just believe that. But there's some things I don't need. I'll be a Christian as long as dot dot dot. You know what you're trying to do if you do that? You're trying to name Jesus. You're trying to give him the name. But here it is. I'm so sorry. You don't name Jesus. Jesus names himself. In fact, Jesus names you. Eventually, the Bible says Jesus is going to give you your name. And not the other way around. Uh, Revelation, chapter 2, verse 17. Here's Jesus talking. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. You don't give Jesus his name. You're not in control. You have to give up control if you want Jesus. He, listen, if Jesus is just your advisor, if Jesus is just an assistant, if Jesus is just another friend, you don't have Jesus. You have a Jesus that you made in your image. You don't ask him to do what you want to do. You give your life away. I give myself away. I give myself away. So, uh, Jesus doesn't recommend things to you. Now, uh, I just want to I just want to just just press you on just a little bit on this last one, okay? If you've been a Christian for at least 10 years, 
for, for any amount of time, you understand this. There is a point in every Christian's life, and not just one point, it happens again and again, where you will come to a decision and you know, oh, you know what you want. Oh, God, if you just, oh, just let me have this. Oh, God, I know you want, mm. but God, if you will just let me. Mm. If you can't say amen, you can say ouch. Oh, you know, oh, your, your body, your everything's telling you, but you know from the Bible, from the Spirit of God Himself, from all your Christian brothers and sisters telling you, no, no, you, it's this way. How do you do it? How, what does it take to, to choose the way and the will of God? It takes courage. So that's the only way you have Emmanuel, God with you. Just like Joseph. Just like Joseph. Now, the final thing, okay? Uh, to have it, you need courage to admit you are a sinner. That means to lose your self-righteousness. So, listen, this is the most important. This is the foundation. The most fundamental. To admit you're a sinner, to lose your self-righteousness. So, <clears throat> what is Jesus' mission? Can we actually read it here? In verse 21. It says, He will save His people from their sins. Why did Jesus come on Christmas? To save you from your sins. Well, really? That's Chris. I thought it was to empower me, to enable me. I thought it was to give me love and to, to help me live my best life now. And I'm the head and not the tail. I'm, I'm, I go before and not... You know, I'm the first and not the last. Yeah, that comes after. Okay. The number one thing that Jesus came to do, it says right there, to save us from our sins. That means, if you're not a sinner, you don't need Jesus. But if you are a sinner, whew, that's hard to admit. Uh, yeah. Can you say this? I am alienated from God. I am a moral failure. I rebelled and rejected him. I don't love him with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. I don't love my neighbor as I, as I love myself. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Before anything else, I know I want love and joy and peace and happiness and faith and good health. I know I want that prosperity. But right now, I need salvation through that. Now, if you can't say that, you lack courage. Okay? You know it's true, but you need to admit it to yourself. If you can't admit it, you lack courage. It takes enormous courage to admit this. Why? Okay, so here's what it is. Before you became a Christian, before all of us become Christians, here's what a lot of us think. I'm a good person. <laughs> okay, I make mistakes, but I know in my heart I'm a good guy. I just I just need help sometimes. I'm a good person. That is what the Bible calls self righteousness. So you know what? It's not only that you have to give up your sins and, and give up the fact that you're real. You have to give up your goodness. You take all your goodness and all your good deeds and all your good thoughts and all your good methods and all your... You just set that aside and you say, Jesus, I'll take you as my goodness. My goodness is not myself. My goodness is Jesus. Jesus, you are... My, that's what it means to be saved from your sins. Right? He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Now, that's the fundamentals. That's the fundamental and everything else comes after that. Everything else. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, so, 
let's let's close it. Let's bring this to an end. Where do we get this courage? Courage to, to lose our reputation, lose our control, lose our self-righteousness. Where does that come from? I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from Jesus. I was sending a message to one of us. Uh, we're, we're having a, 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 a line chat on, uh, on homosexuality. And uh, just what do we do with the people around us who might be gay, lesbian, gender neutral, gender, gender fluid, whatever. And uh, what does it take to, to deny my own identity and deny my own sexuality? Listen, you have no power to do anything. You have no courage in and of yourself. If you really understood what's being taught here, you understand. I have nothing in me that's able to do this. I need it from God. Now, where do you get that? You know, it's interesting. It took way more courage for Jesus to do what he did for us. Infinitely more courage. The thing about Christianity is, Christianity is the only religion that says God needed courage. You say, what? The attributes of God, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-able, He doesn't need courage. Well, it says here that Jesus did. Jesus did. Well, where are you going, Chris? No other religion has God who needs courage. Why? I'll tell you why. It's because of the incarnation, which is all that we're preaching this, this, this season. <laughs> Listen, he became rejectable. He became deniable. He became betrayable. He became torturable. He became killable. That's why he needed courage. He needed courage. And why did he need courage? He decided that you and me are worth everything. He decided, I will lose, Jesus himself said, I will lose my reputation. I will lose my control. I will lose my righteousness as God. I will lose it all because you are worth everything to me. Hmm? Amen. Let me let me flip this around. We'll close with this. Um, last week on the news, they showed a, a bear. A bear was caught in someone's house out in the countryside of Hiroshima. I don't know where. I can't remember where. But you, you folks who live in the countryside, Lord bless you. You got bears coming into your house. Okay. Now, uh, this bear was uh, it was a medium-sized bear. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Which is more scary? To find a large bear in your house or to find a small bear? <laughs> now you see a big old bear in your house, you're like, oh, okay, I'm dead, right? They, or I can, you know, just run away. Or but what if you see a cute, small, just tiny little baby bear? What are you thinking? <laughs> Somewhere mom's around, right? I'm telling you, if I see a big bear, okay. I'm going to run. If I see a small bear, I'm looking around. Who's behind me? Because mama bear is somewhere, somewhere around, right? I'm looking for a baseball bat. I'm looking for a spear. I'm looking for a machine. Okay? But here's the thing. If you stand between a cub and the mama bear, it doesn't you could have a baseball bat, you could have a spear, you can have a machine gun, it doesn't matter. Mommy is coming after you. Right? She can sacrifice her whole life. Where does she get that courage? Love. Love for her baby. How did Jesus face the baseball bat, the infinite 
eternal punishment and wrath of God for us. What was, where was that courage from? Love. He loved us. He loves us. Now and forevermore. You need that love in order to get that courage. So where do you go? You go to Jesus. You come to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I need this courage. I have a decision I'm looking at. I can't do it without your courage. I have friends I might lose. I have family who are rejecting me. I have a reputation I could lose. I need your courage. Lord God, I, 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 I have this control. I have this thing that I want to be. I need courage to let it go. You need that courage. You can only get it from Jesus Christ. So, we come to Him now. We're going to pray. We'll close it off. Lord Jesus, uh, we reflect on the truth of the doctrine of the Incarnation. That you became fully man to be God with us. I pray that this message uh, is food for our souls this week, that you will abide in us even today, even tomorrow, even this evening, even all the rest of this week, that you are abiding with us and empowering us through your Holy Spirit. Uh, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.